Hello and welcome to another episode of Psychology of Crime with me, Dr Jane McCartney. I'm a practising psychologist in the UK and have worked in the criminal field for many years. In these videos, I wanted to look behind the headlines at the psychology of a killer, a murderer, a, a criminal, just to find out exactly what was going on. And I wanted to pick a couple of little points in their history, their criminal history, and give an idea from my professional experience as to potentially what they could have been thinking at that time. Before I get into the video, if I could ask you to hit the like button and subscribe, it just helps with the, obviously the YouTube algorithms enormously and thanks ever so much for doing that. So in today's video, I wanted to look at the crimes and the psychology of Stephen Wright, also known as the Suffolk Strangler. And in a very short time frame between October and December of 2006, he would kill, he was attributed to killing five sex workers, five young girls, but there is suggestion that he did actually kill more of them. But I wanted to look at exactly what was going on inside his head at those times and take four or five little key points in his crime career, if you like, and just exactly explain or, or my suggestion of what he would have been thinking at that time. So when he was cruising for sex, he was a known user of sex workers um, not only in his, his local area, but he'd been in the Merchant Navy and he'd sailed around the world many times. And he was a known user of sex workers wherever the, his his particular ship landed in whatever port. And when he was cruising for sex, what would he have been thinking at those times? He would have been thinking, right, OK, I'm wanting sex. I don't have much money because he was very up and down with his jobs. He could never hold on to jobs for very long. And at the time of his murders and his conviction he was in a long-term relationship with somebody that he would apparently drop off for her night shift she worked in a call center in the local area and he would drop her off and he would go immediately to the red light district and he would look for the vulnerable the girls that he knew because they were all heroin addicts and the girls that he knew that would be wanting the money to be able to go off and get their their next hit and he would negotiate with them and in that negotiation would become power and control and he would enjoy the exploitation of that he, to him they were putting themselves there why couldn't they clean themselves up why couldn't they you know stop using why you know there's a million whys but they didn't and they were on the streets for a reason and he was the reason so they were also there to be exploited to be negotiated over he would have had no empathy with them whatsoever he would have had no understanding of their situation of their suffering their distress some of them had children some of them didn't but he didn't care at all and apparently the first girl that he killed and I'm not going to mention any names here and I'm not going to mention the actual nature of his killing either because that's for another podcast or another video but I just want to talk about his psychology and the first girl that he killed or he was attributed with killing would have been as uh, somebody that I'd read that he'd known and he would have had apparently he had a disagreement with her because because of her drug use she had very bad skin and he found that ironically disgusting and she would have got into his car again he would have been annoyed about how she looked she just wanted to get it over with and get her money so she could go off and, and put it towards the drugs but he wanted more from that he wanted her to be able to have listened to him to have understood him his needs not only just his sexual needs his needs for her not to be looking so terrible as far as he was concerned and whether an argument went on or not I don't know but he he, he would end up he would strangle her and what would he have thought when he was doing that? He would have thought, yes, I'm in control. I'm the powerful one. You didn't do what I wanted you to do. And also, there's this added thrill to this. This is, I've been using sex workers for years. I've never felt this. I quite like this. And who are you? You're no one. You're not even going to be reported missing. She was a, 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 a day later by her mother because she hadn't returned home. These were people that were still very much loved by their family. But he wouldn't have thought that. He would have thought, no, you're nobody and I can get rid of you. And he, he, he did something. He tried to hide her body. And it would have been to him some kind of validation. And the fact that he wasn't 
he woke up the following morning and there weren't police knocking on his door, he would have thought, well, that's great. I got away with that. And because I've got away with that, mm, it's not really a crime, is it? They've not caught me, so it's not a crime. And when he, he subsequently would have gone looking for girls again to potentially have, have sex with, but also with the notion in his head that he's going to kill them because he can. And he would do this five times attributed to him. As I say, they, they think there may have been more. And when he was hiding the bodies, again, what would his, th his thoughts have been? He would have been thinking, oh, aren't I a clever person? I'm getting away with this. This is validation. This is me being validated for my ego. I, that You know, why, why would they catch me? I'm too clever for them. It would have been his twisted reasoning to himself that he's not going to have these girls ruin his life. They're insignificant. They're nobody. They're, you know, they're junkies. They're selling sex on the street. They're insignificant. And they are not going to ruin my life. And therefore, I'm going to hide the bodies. And this kind of happened... You know, it happened a couple of times before bodies were found, two, two, two of the girls were found. And then he did something very curious. On the third killing, he specifically placed the body in a very distinct way, in a, in a crucifix-type way. And again, that possibly was him thinking, as I've said about serial killers before, they think they're so clever that they'll never get caught, but there's just that tiny little bit of them that wants to put something in the bank for the future to say, well, of course, I was being led by the voice of God because he laid in a crucifix position. And that's the reason why I did this. They want to plead insanity so they hopefully get a lesser sentence or they get sent to a secure hospital as opposed to a prison. That's potentially the idea behind that. And... It's also a kind of a fantasy about who he is. He's this bloody clever serial killer that nobody's ever going to catch because he is so clever. And I can control the situation. I can do this. I can lay this girl's body out. And, and he, he did it in such a way that she was going to be found. But I think he was kind of getting this complex about himself that he was so clever at what he was doing because he hadn't been caught for the first two killings. And he was going to be able to carry on doing this. Um, but his, his thoughts about that, his dismissal, his I'm the one in control, I'm the powerful one, I believe came from his earlier experiences of when he was a young child he and his brother were left by their mother who took his youngest two sisters with with her and they were left in the care of their father now nothing terrible or abusive happened with his father she he remarried and seemingly his second wife for his steam rights stepmother was a perfectly okay person so there's no trauma there's no terror going on there there's no abuse going on there but what had happened was he had been left and another term for that is he had been rejected and that is just about everybody's biggest fear in life we can dress it up as fear of failure or abandonment issues but that fear of rejection he would have had and Apparently, he'd been married a couple of times before. He'd been highly narcissistic and abusive, especially to his second wife. They'd met on when they were both working on cruise ships and there was an incident where he was insisting that she went out with some of the crew members when they were in Hawaii or somewhere. And she didn't want to go because it knew it would upset him and she, you know incurred the wrath of his annoyance and his drunkenness before but he insisted that she went so she duly went and when they got back he shredded all of her her uniform seemingly and said something along the lines of well here's a Hawaiian skirt for you because he believed instantly she was going off with another man there was a group of them but in his mind because he's being you know he's paranoid and he's waiting to be rejected again because the the principal role model in his family his mother had rejected him or so he he see he thought and he was then attributing that to every single relationship female relationship he would have throughout his life even these brief encounters with these girls because there's negotiation that goes on on the streets and sometimes they just don't want to know you perhaps they've got somebody that that's going to be less freaky and weird that they feel safer with but other times there would be times where he would they would have to go to him he was known for driving around the area in combat um 
uh, outfit. Again, another bizarre, strange fantasy perhaps he had. I don't think he was ever in the military. In fact, I know he was never in the military. He was in the, the Navy, Merchant Navy. But he was known for being this bit of this oddball character and just sometimes they wouldn't have wanted to know him. But the times that they were desperate because they needed the money, he would have exploited that. And that's exactly his thoughts. Right, I'm exploiting you, but you're exploiting me. You are nothing. I am certainly not going to get caught for you because you are so nothing. And therefore, I'm going to make a show of hiding bodies or when it comes to it and there's lots of police around and the television crews have moved in because they believe they've got a serial killer in the area, I'm going to just bank that little thing about madness so I'll eventually get away with it. He would have made himself in these situations, not just the situations with the, the girls that he killed, but he would have made himself feel better at the expense of other people and that's classic narcissistic traits that's classic psychopathy traits i will make myself feel better at your expense and who are you you are nobody look at you you're walking the streets selling sex for a really low amount of money i can even negotiate with you you're that desperate and that's what he would have thought about these girls they are to be dismissed there is no relationship there is an interaction you know they're a transaction that's all they are for the sex but also it became a transaction for the thrill that he wanted from that so those are the thoughts of some of the thoughts of Stephen Wright it's not all of it and it's just just to give you an idea of potentially what was going on in his mind when he committed the crimes that he did and he got a whole life tariff, which means in the UK, it's a pretty rare thing, but it means in the UK that he will never be eligible for parole. So he will spend the rest of his life in prison for his, his terrible crimes, which, of course, he denied from the beginning. You get some serial killers that realise that there's no point denying what they've done but he didn't he did and so it had to go to full trial of course which again is all part of the narcissism which is all part of the attention that he wants for himself because that's what he would have been craving his entire life to be right to be powerful to be in control to be superior because deep down he's still that little boy waving his mother and younger sisters on a train when he was, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight, something like that. And seemingly, I don't know what the relationship was between his parents, but seemingly he either never saw his mother again or his, and she didn't live that far away, but his interaction with her or anything to do with her was very, very limited. So what concept he would have he thought about himself as, you know, that I'm useless, I'm worthless, I've got a mother that doesn't live very far away, she took my sisters, she obviously loved them more. He did have a brother as well, so the same thing was happening to him. But he would have thought, I'm worthless, I'm useless, right? I'm never in my entire life going to let that happen again. And as he grew into adulthood, that sense of control and power and superiority and judgment and all the things that come with that type of personality would have grown and would have expanded. And the company that he kept and the the wives that he, he would have married that he could bully and boss around, he certainly would have done that because that's the type of personality he was until it got to this point of wanting the the thrill of the sex as well, but also, I hate to say it, but the thrill of the kill and everything that went on for him with that as well. So that was Stephen Wright, the also known as the Suffolk or the Ipswich, Ipswich Strangler. And again, I would ask you if you could like and subscribe to the channel. It just, you know, helps with those algorithms. And I also have, and I'll put a, a link below to a podcast that I do called Why Killers Kill. And it goes into just a, a little bit more detail about the, the, the killings and, and what had gone on. So thanks ever so much for watching and I will see you next time. Thanks then.